The Giving Done Right podcast is brought to you by the Walton Family Foundation. Everyone deserves an opportunity to succeed, no matter where you live, what you look like, or how modest your beginnings. But how do we create access to opportunity so that people have a chance to reach their full potential? The Walton Family Foundation believes in the power of opportunity to transform lives, build strong communities, and protect a natural world that sustains us all. For more than 30 years, the Walton Family Foundation has been inspired by those who never see a challenge without striving to overcome it. Those whose inventions are driven by necessity. The dreamers, the doers. Those who are closest to the problem, because they are often closest to the solution. Opportunity thrives in healthy environments. It withers in ailing ones. Opportunity should never be limited by geography. No one ever solved a big problem by thinking small. And it is never easy overcoming tough challenges. It takes time and steady resolve. One thing is true. Everyone deserves an opportunity to succeed. Learn more at waltonfamilyfoundation.org. We all know, I think, that we need the arts in order to move through space and time to understand who we are as a society. Welcome to Giving Done Right, a podcast on everything you need to know to make an impact with your charitable giving. I'm Grace Nicolette. And I'm Phil Buchanan. Today, we are going to talk with Dr. Elizabeth Alexander. She's a renowned author, poet, scholar, educator, and now she's the president of the $8 billion Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Elizabeth Alexander is author of 14 books, including two that were nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Her book, The Light of the World, is a memoir about the death of her husband. I highly recommend it. She also gave the inaugural poetry reading at President Obama's inauguration in January 2009. She's an incredibly accomplished person, and we talk with her in this interview about what it means to bring a social justice or racial equity perspective to your philanthropy. And we also talk about the relationship between pursuing goals related to equity and arts and culture. We talk about the Monuments Project that the Mellon Foundation is leading, which has to do with telling a more accurate and inclusive story about the country's history. So there's a lot here for individual donors who really care about justice to learn from. Here's our conversation with Dr. Elizabeth Alexander. Elizabeth, welcome to the Giving Done Right podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk together. I've been reflecting a lot about what it means to come to philanthropy with tools and abilities from other kinds of work and how important it is to bring people in and to kind of unlock their tools, abilities, and perspectives in philanthropy. The story begins with Darren Walker, really, and with his uncanny ability to recognize ability and also his tremendous generosity of spirit and his brilliance at rebuilding philanthropy as a field into a place that is more focused on justice and more inhabited with different sorts of perspectives. Darren recruited me to the Ford Foundation. So now we're talking five years ago when this adventure began, I was director of creativity and free expression. Um, which was Ford's work in arts and culture, journalism, and film. And it was diving into the deep end. At first, I, I, I literally was like, why are you calling me? What is it that you think I bring to this work? Not in a falsely modest way, but in a literally like, I don't understand what philanthropy is. And I don't understand what you think it takes to be good at it. And what he said that I really value is, he said, in Cherry and African-American Studies Department, you are running an under-resourced complex organization. You're running an organization that, uh, you know, you're bringing people together from all over the university and in the world of African-American studies as an interdisciplinary department. We had people from the law school, the divinity school, the forestry school, the economics department, the history department. (laughs) And that was a much more complicated mission, working indeed at at a very wealthy institution with very little resource. And that actually would not only enable me to run a team within a larger complex organization, but would bring some understanding to 
what it means to empower folks to do the work uh, as we do in philanthropy. So it was two years at Ford that I returned for five seconds to the academy at, and kind of simultaneous with that moment, the opportunity to lead Mellon as a possibility came my way. And what seemed so amazing about that was the one piece that wasn't there in my work at Ford was higher education. And that was the world that I'd spent my whole life in uh, at Mellon, where in addition to being the nation's largest funder in arts and culture, we are also the largest funder in humanities in higher ed. I think finally, what I would add is that as a single mother, I bring tremendous practicality to all of our work. Um, I like simplified solutions. I understand what it is to multitask and things that sometimes seem like too much. I think we just shouldn't look at them as too much. Also, what it means and this to uh, a larger value with doing our work, but also an ethos within the foundation is that we are complete people. This is what Black feminist leadership looks like. You know, so that means that to be professional doesn't mean to lop off your head from the rest of your body, right? right? You know, to lop off your eight hours from the rest of the day. And I think that actually the people I work with are tremendously hardworking, tremendously effective, but I hope that they understand that what enables that is a kind of holistic acceptance of our full humanity, which after all is the thing that we're trying to do at Mellon. It's been so interesting because this period of the pandemic has made it more acceptable, maybe even necessary for us to share more about our full lives with each other. Mm -hmm. Um, And I... um, like so many people in this country, read your beautiful memoir about your experience losing your husband called The Light of the World, which I can't recommend highly enough. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about this issue of how the personal and the professional intersect, you know, that you're sort of alluding to, and how we do a better job as leaders and also for donors supporting organizations, how can we help folks to be able to be their full selves as they also pursue these important objectives to make it more possible for a nonprofit leader to say to a donor, hey, I can't do that right now because I got to go pick up my kids. You know, like this is a conversation we're having nationally, right? I think, and I wonder how you see it playing out in your work in philanthropy and with the nonprofit leaders that you support? Well, I'll answer that kind of very broadly. I think from a life's work and a life I have brought to philanthropy, an absolutely consistent orientation towards justice. That's what I come out of in my family from people who always taught me that it's important to share whatever resources or advantages you have, that learning and critical thinking and helping people to to do that so that they can be further empowered is the sacred work and crucial work that uh, we continue to be in a fight for full human rights. So that's why the the mission of bringing um, diverse creativity and thinking and deep knowledge to more people, I actually truly believe is a solution uh, among many solutions. And anyway, that's what I know how to do. I think that also one of the things that we see sometimes is privilege is made invisible. So I have noticed at many different moments in time that people don't talk about the privilege that allows them to have long vacations in lovely places or the privilege, and I don't use this in a totalizing way, but I've had many male colleagues with wives who don't work outside of the home, which is all well and good. But that means that if I come and say I need a research assistant and in a matter of fact way, I hear from colleague X, that's something that his wife does for him. But, and why, 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 why do I need that? True story. True story repeated many, many times. So uh, I don't care what your life is like. I do care if the privileges of one's life make other people be judged as somehow not measuring up, not being able Mm. to keep up. 
I think that's just one kind of workplace example where I think the workplace has responsibility to be as helpful as possible to enable great work from the people who are there. And that's mm-hmm. going to look uh, different to a lot of us. I do think that we need to have understanding that all of our lives and situations are not the same in what's beautiful about working at Mellon. And I think in the three years I've been there, the way that my colleagues have completely come on board to our newly articulated social justice mission, that I think we love our work. I think that we see the importance of what it is to be on this team at this time, that in the pandemic, my goodness, when we saw both the fragility of uh, the arts and culture sector and its under-resourcedness, which I know we're going to talk about more, and thought about what we could do to be helpful. That was driving throughout the most difficult time that uh, I think any of us can remember going through. So enabling all of us to do this beautiful work and be a community, since after all, also work is where we spend so much of our time. So I, I just think we have to be a functional supported community. And that's how also ripples of equity and care radiate out. Mm-hmm. You have to start where you are. You have to start in your home and then you go to your block and you go to your neighborhood and you go to your workplace. And I believe that that has tremendous power. That is very powerful. I want to come back to the social justice focus But first, I wanted to ask you about what the pandemic has meant for the arts and the humanities. What can donors do to make sure that vital institutions, all the way down to small nonprofits, come back from this time? Well, I can um, answer that by talking about some of what we've been doing with other colleagues, both other foundations and also with individual donors. Here is the problem. In the under-resourcedness, and by the way, at Mellon, we have historically supported larger organizations. We're still with some of them, but as we've been asking questions about resources, uh, we've had to ask, what does your board look like? Do you have access to other resources? Who might not receive funding, if not for our contributions? Is there another way you might go about this? Those Hmm. questions are, are important. So we've moved from the large, brought in a lot of smaller, they're not exclusively smaller, And we have not traditionally supported individual artists. It wouldn't be practical. But in the pandemic, when we saw that in the arts, you basically, with one blow, went to almost complete unemployment for artists. There's scarcely an industry that has been affected like that. Hmm. At the organizational levels, if people coming to visit and paying any kind of entry fee is a part of your model, that's over. That's not all the way figured out yet. Even if you come, I'm going to the theater next week and we will be spaced. So that means however many less people paying for a ticket. That if you think also about all of the artists who are performers, with that I also include writers who read their work. And I just looked at my writer friends as the gigs just evaporated. Hmm. And so even if, let's say you have a job teaching or doing something else, that is income that people count on. And again, we haven't fully figured out how to come back from that. We joined with some others to do Artist Relief, which was a program we were really proud of um, that we did for a few rounds administered by USA Artists. And that was a way they were able to get quick amounts of money, not huge amounts of money, but money to artists in cycles that turned over every single week. Hmm. And that did, I think, make a difference. Although, again, the thing that we learned from that is that it was a drop in the bucket to the need. Yeah. So we did a lot of emergency funding efforts at Mellon. We did a a small museums initiative and a a medium museums Hmm. initiative nationwide. Again, not because large museums were not in trouble. They were. But in trying to think strategically about what we could do effectively, we thought, well, these littler folks might close. Mm -hmm. They might close with no way to figure out how to reopen. We also did artists' relief in New York, in Los Angeles, thinking about cities where there are not only very high concentrations of people, but 
high concentrations in the arts sector. And now what we have coming forward is an initiative called Creatives Rebuild New York, where we will be able to support a universal basic income uh, to Mm -hmm. a number of artists. We're really proud of that because I think that it asserts a few important things. One, that artists got to get paid. Yeah. (laughs) Let's just start with that. You know, we all enjoy what artists make. We all know, I think, that we need the arts in order to move through space and time to understand who we are as a society. But what is the labor? How are artists workers? And how do we think about supporting that is another thing. So let's say I'm a donor who has identified that I would like to give to the arts and the humanities. There's sort of a range of options I could choose, as you mentioned, large institutions all the way down to individual artists. Where should folks go to find artists or organizations that are really moving the needle? How would you advise individual donors to get started? So, I mean, seriously, the first thing I would say is let's talk. Um, Because (laughs) I think tremendous colleagues, this is what we do all day Mm -hmm. long. And as I said, again, being national funders, and having tremendous staff expertise, people with lifetimes of experience in yeah. the arts. All day long, we're looking, hunting, saying yes, saying no. And so I think to engage with individual donors about questions like, are, are you a place-based thinker? Or are you thinking in a national way? Um, do you see something particular in the place where you are? Which I think is where all great thinking starts. Is there a genre uh, hmm. about which you have particular knowledge? Sometimes people have particular devotions or knowledges. We just supported with the Ford Foundation some beautiful work for artists with disabilities. Hmm. Uh, and so to really think about what are new paradigms of what is really useful to you? Yeah. Let me not assume I know what it takes for you to do your work. I, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper. I know that within arts and humanities, some donors, obviously the arts can be viewed as upstream from culture. Down, I mean, there's a lot of ways to look at it, but I know that some donors see value in really influencing the culture at large. And I've been very interested in the Monuments Project at Mellon. And so I'm wondering, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, we are so excited about the Monuments Project. When I was coming into Mellon in the interview process, this was an idea I had. Thinking about our built environment, thinking about the commemorative landscape, thinking about the statues and memorials and other kinds of spaces and objects that say who we are, that tell the stories of who we are. I think what we are collectively realizing in very powerful ways now is that commemorative landscape does not begin to tell uh, the story of who we are in this country in its variety. And further and more perniciously, what we're seeing is that the um, built monumental environment disproportionately values men, values white people, values acts of war and aggression and very specifically, venerates the lost cause of the Confederacy. Yes. Once you start thinking about this, you can't stop, Mm -hmm. I think. When you think about the fact that not only did the Confederacy lose the Civil War, so what does it mean, for example, for U.S. Army bases to be named for Confederate generals, to be named for people who failed in acts of uh, war and aggression, and who were treasonous yes. to the union. I mean, it, it really blows my mind on the regular, as we say. Um, <laughs> so, so thinking about the symbols of the Confederacies and thinking about the tremendous possibilities hmm. of what it means to tell different stories in our commemorative spaces. Can you give us an example of like a re-envisioning of a monument? that you've been involved in? Yes. So um, before we had a monuments project as such, we were already doing this work in things like our support of the Equal Justice Initiatives Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama. You know, the great lawyer advocate, civil rights leader, Brian Stevenson, who comes at justice work 
through the law yes. and through advocacy, realized that uh, in order for that work to be ultimately successful, there also had to be narrative change efforts. He knew that there was so much an enmity and stereotype, and he tells the story of going into the courtroom and being treated very disparagingly by a judge who assumed that he was the defendant. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it doesn't matter if you're the lawyer or the defendant, everyone should be respected in a courtroom, but a black man going into that space and being treated disparagingly. And so realizing that he thought it important to tell the story of how we got to mass incarceration, starting with slavery, moving through Jim Crow, Yes. moving through the resistance to the civil rights movement and then moving to over-policing, over-incarceration of Black and Brown people in particular. So we felt it was not only incredibly important to tell that story, and that's what happens in the museum, but the extraordinary memorial, which also surfaces and tells the story of lynching. And that says... The, it's bad enough that these things happen. These stories are submerged. And so one piece of that project um, involved, and imagine uh, along highways in the South named for Confederates, the Jefferson Davis Highway, what does it mean to go by the side of the road and mark the spot where a lynching took place and to hmm. dig some of that soil and put it in jars with people's names and yes. dates and to say, we remember you. Your family can know and have closure on how you died and there could be accountability. So there are these tremendous design by mass designs, really quite something, uh, these hanging slabs that have counties and names yeah. and dates where lynchings took place. And the idea is that all of those counties, not just in the South, further North than we might have imagined, should reclaim those slabs and take them to the site where the crimes happened hmm. and do the reconciliation work in, in community. Brian Stevenson and Equal Justice Initiative, but Brian's work broadly and his book, Just Mercy, is a must read for anyone who resides in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, but is it such a great illustration of working at so many levels? There, there tends to be this sentiment among donors, I think, like, are we going to work on alleviating suffering? So mm -hmm. certainly Brian and the lawyers he works with have sought to help folks who were wrongfully convicted get their convictions overturned. Or are we going to work on the root cause? And Equal Justice Initiative has worked to change policy. Or are we going to work on culture well, that's also part of it. It isn't a either or. All of these things are necessary if we're going to make a real sustained progress towards something like racial equity. And yet, in this particular moment, as you well know, Elizabeth, as many in philanthropy ask, what can I do? And we saw an outpouring of commitments at a level that we hadn't previously seen, sadly, related to racial equity a, a year ago post the murder of George Floyd and everything that that created in terms of the national conversation. We're also simultaneously seeing a pretty well-orchestrated sort of backlash in which philanthropy is being painted as some kind of woke police that is threatening this country's ideals. In this moment here, a, a year after the summer of 2020, what would your counsel be to donors, individual, institutional, about the role of philanthropy and racial equity as we see this kind of mounting backlash to the role of philanthropy? That's a, a big question. And so I'm going to answer in a, a number of different strands. First of all, let's just talk about the term woke. I would like to embrace yes. it for a moment to remind us that it comes from African-American vernacular, which I'm glad it's made it into the mainstream. If you literally think about the condition of being awake or asleep to the world around you, what would you rather be? I'd rather be woke. <laughs> I'd rather have my eyes open yep. Yep. Uh, to the world around me. And that's the exhilaration of being an alive thinking person. Yes. Is that also 
our ideas are constantly building, changing, being challenged, evolving. There's some beautiful work that we're supporting that's being done by a group in Philadelphia called the Monuments Lab that's going to really give us some sharp numbers about how many statues of whom and how many places named for et cetera, et cetera. So when you look at marked commemorative images or sites, less than 2% of them are of African-Americans. Less than one half of 1% of them are of Latinx people. Less than one half of 1% less than that are of Asian-American people. If you look at any city, look nationally, look at the map national parks, wherever you measure, a fraction of these sites are devoted to women. So I'll just tell you that about the commemorative landscape to say like, I don't want to be stupid walking around thinking that the men on the losing side of wars on their horses are the whole story. So I think that these are times of tremendous learning, tremendous opportunity. I think that all of the racial tumult that we lived through last year was not confined to last year. It has roots as old as the country. Uh, We are continuing to deal with it moving forward. And I feel like, you know, I will work all my days, really, to um, bring more stories, which is to say more lives. These aren't just stories. These are people's lives. Because when the Confederacy is over-venerated and when it's venerated today, That is explicitly about teaching white supremacy. Right. And that has very real and tragic results every single day. Last year, under your leadership, the Mellon Foundation announced a strategic shift to prioritize social justice in all of its work. What does it mean to give with a social justice lens? And what does that mean to you? So I imagine that there are donors who really care about social justice, but, you know, there's just so many pieces of it. It can be overly broad. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you and what advice do you give to donors who care about social justice? Yes, well, here is where coming out of the academy and devoting a career to teaching critical thinking and really believing um, that critical thinking allows you to understand things and their root causes and how they are systemic rather than responding instance by instance which is not only exhausting and ineffective and doesn't get you to broader, actionable answers, but it is also very easy to default out of them. So I think that to think about social justice, I think that it means that these resources contribute to a fairer and more equitable societal, all of us, not just some of us, not just our families, uh, but All of us, the larger society that we live in, that justice and equity are something that everyone deserves. What's also beautiful about a social justice lens is that it enables you to think about your grant making, but about everything you do. So what is our hiring? Uh, What are our vendor practices? You know, who does the construction on the renovation? I mean, all of these are resources we have to think about. Is there a fair process? through which they are distributed. I think that also what social justice thinking gets you to is understanding, and we've been talking about this, that there are so many stories and experiences and perspectives that have not been elevated. Yeah, We looked at our own grant making and it has changed tremendously because we gave disproportionately to hugely resourced institutions. That doesn't mean that they weren't doing great work. That doesn't mean that we sometimes don't continue to work with them. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I I think here to the the mom practicality, (laughs) um, you know, it's like, did you, did did you have a sandwich? You you know, who, (laughs) you know, (laughs) Phil, give half of your sandwich to Grace. (laughs) And Grace hasn't had lunch yet. I mean, it it sometimes honestly feels as simple as, as that is analyzing what it means because no one should be an eternal grantee. There are uh, so many um, beautiful communities and ideas that can be lifted up for the benefit of all. You know, again, I mean, the arts and culture, we're supporting it for everybody. And that's the ultimate goal. So each episode, we ask each guest the question, giving done right to you is about fill in the blank. How would you answer that? Oh, 
giving done right to me. I will want to probably say this 10 different ways or to say 10 different things because that's such a rich question. But what came immediately to mind was listening and learning and empowering. Hmm. Listening, learning, empowering. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. Phil, I'm curious what you thought of our conversation with Elizabeth Alexander. I thought it was fascinating. There aren't that many poets who run multi-billion dollar foundations. In fact, she might be the one and only. And I think what's so interesting is the way she talks about the importance of the arts, humanities, artists. She obviously recounted the toll that the pandemic took, the work that needed to be done to make sure that folks could just survive, right? And these are people for whom this is their job, this is their livelihood, but also they're enriching our lives and our communities. And I really think that the arts can almost be trivialized sometimes when people talk about their philanthropy, but Elizabeth helps us understand just how fundamental the arts are. Right. The arts and humanities are not extracurricular to a healthy democracy. I'm also just struck by that combination of arts and humanities and their social justice focus that they pivoted to in the last year. And, you know, even in her description of Brian Stevenson's Equal Justice Initiative monument in Montgomery, it's fascinating how arts projects often get at so many different levels, right? You have the policy level, you have the reconciliation, you have the historical, you even have the spiritual. When you're talking about the arts, you may actually be addressing all these different levels at the same time in the same project, and that's incredibly powerful. Yeah, because we've got to change hearts and minds ultimately, right? And that's about what you see, what you learn about the history. And also, I think it was interesting to hear her reflection on the way in which The foundation looked at, well, who are we supporting and is this consistent with our values? And I think every donor can do that, right? There is a tendency, particularly in the early days of one's philanthropy, to just respond to what's in front of you, what you know, what your family's connected to. But that interrogation of yourself and your philanthropy to say, hey, is this consistent with what I believe about equity and opportunity, or am I actually potentially just exacerbating inequities Mm -hmm. with my philanthropy. So important to do that analysis. So Phil, where can people go for more information about effective giving? Well, they can definitely go to our website, gracecep.org or givingdoneright.org for all the podcast episodes and show notes. You can find us on Twitter. I'm at Grace Nicolette, and Phil is at Phil X Buchanan. You can send us a note with any suggestions or comments at gdrpodcast at cep.org. I want to thank our sponsors, as always, the Walton Family Foundation and the National Philanthropic Trust. And if you like the show, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps. Thanks again to Dr. Elizabeth Alexander for joining us today. Giving Done Right is a production of the Center for Effective Philanthropy. It's hosted by me, Grace Nicolette, and Phil Buchanan. It's produced by Sarah Martin, with mixing and engineering by Kevin O'Connell, and additional editing by Isabel Hibbard. Our theme song is from Blue Dot Sessions, and original podcast artwork is by Jay Kuska. A special thanks to our colleagues Molly Heideman, Say Darling, Naomi Rafal, for their research, writing, and logistical support. <laughs>